I would guess we're the only uh, presenters where we have 80% uh, of our entire faculty uh, <laughs> presenting to you. I think that, that's sort of got a, a unique position. Um, what, we, what we have done, uh, and why I, I think you'll find this to be fascinating today, is that we, we will present uh, numerous views on how to integrate the iPad into the curriculum. Um, and you'll see, uh, as I said, a large group of our faculty. They'll introduce themselves as we go along. Um, and what we've done uh, is taken the um, information that I, uh, we got from Apple. We went, and uh, as a university, we went out to um, uh, Cupertino a year ago, February, uh, when the, before the iPad 2s had been announced. Uh, listened to a presentation on what they call challenge-based learning. Uh, one of the things that came up on that was uh, their idea that these are the four ways that technology can be uh, used in a curriculum. Uh, and you're going to see examples of each of those um, uh, in the next hour. Uh, substitution, uh, where we just take um, the technology and use it to, to do something uh, that we would have done anyway. Augmentation, podcasts, uh, apps changing the uh, functionality. The modification is um, uh, making something that is a significant change in the way that a classroom presentation is being done. Uh, and then redefinition where the technology is, is just completely new. Uh, the timeline of, of our uh, commitment to this was um, when the iPad 2s were announced, uh, we happened to be fortunate in that the Apple salesman from uh, for BU was in, was already scheduled to arrive, and at 2 o'clock that afternoon we placed the, the order for the first 20. Uh, we gave all of the faculty and staff iPad 2s uh, by April of uh, last year, uh, with the expectation that all they would uh, need to do is um, uh, play with them, just take them <laughs> home uh, and, and we feel comfortable. And we did. We, we said, okay, we, we know that there's going to be a change in the, in the technology. We're looking forward to the curriculum 2016. The industry is changing, and that we needed to figure out a way to adapt uh, our classroom to where we knew the, the industry was moving. Uh, it's estimated by 2014, 50% of all access to the internet will be either through a tablet or the smartphone. Uh, any of you who have been involved in, in sales know that every hotel salesperson uses uh, an iPad to, to now sell their products. We see it in restaurants, we see it in so many different places. Uh, what we did was uh, we started with the first 20 and then um, we followed up and bought 60 more iPad 2s. And the 60 iPad 2s are installed in two of these. These are our remote uh, carts. Uh, they hold 30 iPads and a, a Mac. Uh, as a master, so that every classroom is, has now been turned into an iPad lab. At the same time, we had, the university came in and um, uh, upgraded our wireless, so we can now handle a thousand uh, devices at any given time. So we put in new Wi-Fi, so we can use the iPads and all the smartphones and the laptops and have uh, complete access at any time. So it was a combined effort. The university came in and upgraded the building, and we also bought the, the equipment. So now we have two. Um, cards that hold 60, uh, we can roll them in all at once, or we can separate them and have them in. And then the system is very simple. The students come in and, and sign them out, uh, and then sign them back in before they leave. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, ch we took this and then challenged the faculty to say, okay, you've got them for the summer. Uh, we're going to require that every course uh, in the fall of 2011 take advantage of iPad technology, and we don't care what that means. You do anything you want, but every course has to use them at least once during the semester, and hopefully more. But uh, the challenge was, we threw the challenge to the faculty and said, you figure out how your, your particular content is suitable for a, using a tablet-based technology. From that time, uh, basically a year later, uh, you'll see what came out of it. And so, um, <coughs> What we'll do is let the faculty show you uh, what this is. All right. Thank you, Dean Muller. Um, my name is uh, Professor Erin Tucker, and I'm going to speak to you a little bit on integrating iPads for the teaching and learning element. Um, when we look at the concept of learning overall, and we've talked <coughs> to those of you who are teaching 
uh, Career Academy this morning, we talked about it from the assessment perspective, but I want us to kind of get a little bit broader and look at this conversation that's going on right now with technology integration and whether it's kind of the chicken or the egg. Which one comes first? Does the curriculum drive the technology or does technology drive the curriculum? Overwhelmingly right now, I'm finding within the literature that the curriculum you must still have a uh, certain objective set um, and have your curriculum very, very clear and integrate the technology into that. iPads are simply mobile devices. They are not substitutes for um, a laptop. So with that mobile device, smartphones, et cetera, how can we then take that and allow there to be some sort of learning while integrating that? Einan and Lo uh, Lother in 2010 basically created three broad categories of using technology. Three areas that I'll discuss um, is technology for instructional preparation, the use of technology for the actual delivery of the material, as well as technology as a learning tool. When we look at instructional preparation, it's very clear that the instructor needs to have clear objectives and outcomes. What are you, try what are you trying to measure and how do you go about measuring it? So for example, with um, my uh, a project, in-class project, that um, I did in my, one of my event classes, I actually stated what the objective was. And that objective was to design an event concept with the project plan <coughs> given to them and describe the overall concept by incorporating text, pictures, and music using the iPad itself. So I already had what the objectives were for this particular uh, project. I provided the project plan uh, to them and then they used that particular <coughs> pad uh, for that. Also, um, in preparation, uh, it requires that the instructor to prepare differently, which may take you more time. Okay, it's, gonna, it's a different type of prep, all right? So even though you do have your objective set, you're gonna have to kind of um, add in a couple little areas <coughs> such as all oh, appropriate cords and equipment. You need to also make sure that audio, if you're using audio in the classroom, it needs to be able to read the device. Overall, you're gonna have to have some sort of support from staff. All right, because they're gonna to have to help you to make sure that you're prepared properly. And the second area, which is instruction delivery. So how we actually use the technology to deliver it. As instructors can present instruction by means of the unit and projector. So it's making sure that within the classroom and you're delivering it, that your, your projector can properly read the device as well. Um, I also found that YouTube, which a lot of instructors use to reinforce something that they're learning, when you're using an iPad, there are some YouTube videos that are not mobile compatible. So you need, it kind of goes back to that prep again. You just have to make sure that um, those elements work. In order to maximize capability, you will need Wi-Fi, all right? Because Wi-Fi needs to really be activated for there to be some sort of maximum use. In addition, students may use these devices and learning applications to disseminate information for themselves. So in part of your delivery, creating that project uh, as well. In the third area, which is the use of technology um, within the classroom as a learning tool, I found that um, when we look at learning, depending on how you would like to measure it, one of the great things about using the mobile device is that students, you know, are they gonna be able to solve real world problems? Ultimately, how are we using this? So students use this um, as part of their presentation. Um, I have two examples here of students that uh, did presentations. They actually included the iPad within the class. So I have uh, uh, one group, Lieber and Perry, they actually, this was for my human resources class, they did, we distributed the iPads out to the students. They were able to take an online assessment of learning styles, and then they were able to discuss their learning styles with the class and, and translate that into what type of training would be the most appropriate for you as an employee. This particular application Shalita and Frankel used, which was on court, um, they actually used this as well as a training module. How do you teach staff relatively quickly about different lines? But in this particular case, students ended up solving the problem. I didn't have to end up doing it. All right, they ended up taking it and running it with them. In addition to this problem solving, which is what really um, you know we want to do, is that you know while working in groups within the class. They're able to collaborate better. If someone doesn't know something, they actually help each other with it, et cetera. The use of applications, these apps are very essential because that's the reason why you have this mobile device, all right? Not just for them to go online, but do you have that on access as well? As well as to be able to showcase students' final work in class. So as a result, what I did was, and it's a little bit difficult to see, on the left here, I actually created an in-class assignment where they actually had to put together a project plan. Remember back from my objective from that first slide. 
I provided them the project plan, but this project plan, which looks a little bit like Excel, is actually called a number, <coughs> numbers, which is the um, Excel, which is the Apple version of Excel. All right, so they were able to go actually use this, et cetera, and then they ended up emailing it to me while I was using the iPad, and then I showcased the work at the end. The key really to this is one is to always go back to the original purpose. Or did you write and develop clear objectives and outcomes? Did you prepare your materials and equipment you know, in enough time? Did you allow the class to shift from teaching-centered to student-centered? That's a little bit of a different discussion, but I found that in using this, um, that occurs as well. Incorporate iPad mobile units and applications in doses. Don't feel like you have to do it all at, you know, you have to just take, you know, uh, you know the, the, uh, eat everything um, on, the, uh, on the plate. You can take it in doses, you know, do small things. And ultimately, learning should be really that impetus that drives the use of technology really within schools as well as in the classrooms. On that note, um, we will have um, different uh, examples that other professors have used. And I'm going to call up Dr. Brad Hudson, who will discuss the supply and demand of publishing, faculty publishing, and the e-textbook. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so I am Brad Hudson. I uh, teach marketing at BU. And the particular aspect of, of the iPad that I became interested in over the past year was digital publishing. I created a, a little conceptual model. I don't claim this is, this is my own. Uh, I'm sure that there, some of this has been covered in publications. But at the top, we see the actors involved in publishing, uh, from author to publisher to instructor to student. And then the next one down, we see the formats from old to new, voice, which we're doing right now, paper, <laughs> digital, and interactive. And I think you all have seen that this has all become muddled and blended, basically. So now authors and instructors are the same people, but increasingly with digital uh, uh, technology, the uh, instructor can become the publisher, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And, and the students with iPad, uh, we're trying to do a lot of interactive exercises. The students are increasingly selecting themselves the content that enters the classroom. So who, who creates, who selects the content, it's all becoming blended. Uh, and in, uh, I'll show some examples in a minute. In my classroom, we're using voice, paper, digital, and interactive, all in the same classroom, the same semester. Um, and I will point out down here at the bottom uh, the idea of a module, which Peter will talk about in a moment. Uh, so in terms of publishing, by the, for the instructor in the university to get involved in publishing their own material, what are the advantages? Control over what's in your classroom, customization, highly customized, cycle time. I can do my, sometimes in some classes I can do my course back the day before the semester starts. Uh, and cost, significantly less expensive for the university to become a publisher and in some cases for students to buy the materials. The stuff I'm going to show you that's digital today is about half the price of paper. Okay, so using this model, in my classrooms, I think most of the classrooms at BU, next semester we're going to be using Pearson materials on paper, Harvard materials on paper, uh, Course Smart, which is separate from Pearson but has a lot of the Pearson stuff on it. Up to now it has been sort of like a PDF static thing. They're trying to get more interactive. Xanadu course packs, they're now highly interactive. You've seen the latest version. Uh, and Inkling, which is an interactive textbook, and I'll show you a quick example of that. And then in terms of the technologies that are being used, we're using a lot of PDF. The stuff from Harvard is PDF. Our own stuff is PDF. Uh, we're also using iAnnotate, which I'll show you in a second. And it's all aimed toward the iPad, but it goes on a lot of different devices. So um, but not all of these technologies work on every device, but, but many of them do. Um, so let me show you first uh, the iAnnotate. So I use Harvard case studies in a lot of my senior classes. These come PDF from Harvard right now. Any, how many people have used iAnnotate already? Okay. So what iAnnotate is, is it's an extra app. I think it's about 10 bucks. It sits on the iPad and conceptually, it, sort of in old technology parlance, what it allows you to imagine a case study that's on paper and you take an acetate and put it on top of it and now you can write on the case. That's what iAnnotate does. It takes a PDF and lets you write on the case and store it and save it. So you never need to print it out as paper if you want to highlight it. So let me show you an example of this. So this is a Starbucks case that we use. Um, and I've, I'll, I'll show you a couple of quick ones because we don't have a lot of time. But for example, this bar over on the right is, is iAnnotate. That's the program running on top of the PDF. So if I want to uh, highlight 
the first line or the second line. I can do that. If I want to underline part of it, I can do that. Uh, if I want to add in a, a particular note here or there, I can add, you know, add note uh, and then pin it. I can also set bookmarks. So I did some stuff before we came here. I put some material in here and set a bookmark. So now I can jump ahead almost to the last page. And this is part of an exercise where they have to do some calculations and they're supposed to realize that they need to add in the number of months. That's part of the Harvard trick for the calculation. So these red numbers are numbers that I've added into this. So for example, I can now show this to the class and say, <coughs> see if you multiply these numbers by 12, 3.12 times 3.9 times 3.88 times 1.1, you get $199, it's the lifetime value of the customer. So I've added that in on top of what Harvard provided. And then if I want to go back to um, the first page, right, I can just zip back. Very cool program. And it works on any PDF. Uh, so and they can email it to themselves. Say they, again? They can email their notes to themselves. Yes, depending on whose iPad they're using and how they're doing it, they can email it to themselves. So, so how I did this in preparation, I just started making the notations and emailed it to myself. Uh, so here we have an Inkling textbook. This is the Kotler marketing text that I use. Uh, it's not the hospitality one, they don't have that on Inkling yet, so we're using the regular one. Uh, but you've got a variety of things here. You've got traditional text. You can do other things on here. You can, you can highlight, you can underline, just like in, in, in iAnnotate. But it's got some other cool features. Uh, you can take quizzes. You can check your answer, not quite. Uh, it's got embedded videos. Oops, it's got it's got photographs, but it's got some embedded videos. Let's see if I can find the one I was thinking of. Uh, yes, yeah, so here's a embedded video about Joie de Vivre hospitality. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop this because we don't have enough time. Uh, so back to there we go. Okay, uh, so that gives you sort of an idea of of the things that are here already, and I think coming increasingly. I, I, we've sort of looked at it. We think that I think that I annotate is sort of the one to use on PDFs, and Inkling is sort of the coolest interactive textbook. But there's a lot of competing products out there. If you go to the Harvard site, they'll give you four. I think it's four <coughs> I annotate type programs you can choose. The last thing I want to talk about that we're doing ourselves, we're getting into the publishing business. So we're Boston University is starting a publishing division. We're going to start publishing cases, digital cases, not just from from um, uh, not just from BU faculty, but potentially your cases. Uh, and we're starting a digital journal, the Boston Hospitality Review. And I'll just show you a couple of quick sort of cover shots to give you an idea of what this, this magazine is about. Uh, if you think of it as, a, as, a, as a, uh, uh, a continuum from journal marketing on one end to travel and leisure on the other, we want to be right in the center, which is sort of where Harvard Business's review is, but uh, maybe even a little more sort of consumer friendly and certainly more more visually appealing. Uh, so, there we go. so this is a yes. This is, this is a mock-up. This this will be available PDF, but it'll also be optimized for viewing on the iPad. So this is what the front page would look like. Each of these represents an article. These are we're launching in September our first issue. These are not the articles in September. These are just mock-ups that we were using. Um, among other things, to get our sponsor, Pinnacle Advisory Group. Uh, so maybe an article about uh, lodging, Outlook, our beans from Boston, something about Richard Branson, the allure of somewhere else, Boston hotels in the 19th century, history is my thing. You get the idea. We, you know, behind these fairly snazzy covers, we're hoping is, is, is an article that's like a hybrid between travel and leisure and journal and marketing, somehow like scrunched together. Uh, so, that is me, Dr. Michael Oceans. I give it to you. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, so Chris said, Dean Bowler said, take the iPads, give them out in the classroom, and figure out what you can do with them. <laughs> so that's what I did. And there were some successes and some failures. So I teach summer term. Uh, I was actually teaching yesterday. And I was teaching an intro <coughs> class. I was telling the students, which, and I used to do a straight lecture. And so I'm trying to go from, you know, sage on the stage to guide on the side, which is great for these iPads. You give them out and say, all right. I used to explain what a consortium was. 
uh, and what what uh, what association is and what and then now I just give them the iPad and say, all right, figure out what a consortium is. What's what? And so they take them out and they get into teams and talk about well, what's the difference between Rolay and Chateau and luxury hotels of the world and and. They come back with us. You break in little groups. They come back and they start doing their own announcements. And all of a sudden, they start doing the teaching, uh, which changes the way my classroom operates. Which is, um, it's really hard for me to give that up because I like being in <laughs> charge of everything. And once you just sort of free flow and let go, uh, it actually becomes really exciting. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And the kids are great. If I don't know how to use anything, I ask the students. They tell me what I'm doing is wrong in terms of my computers. So one of the things we're able to do, I was able to do, is that um, Chris talked about the substitution uh, and then augmentation. So one of the things I was able to do was work with BUIT and develop my own app. So there's a program I used to do, or an exercise I used to do for my uh, for the intro class, which was figuring out um, how much money a restaurant makes. So there's only three variables involved in that, uh, which is how big, how much, how fast. So I used to do this with a chalkboard. How big, how much, how fast. It was a little tedious, take a, a little time, and I used to do a lot of the, lot of the work myself. By giving out the iPad, we developed an app with BUIT. I didn't do the programming. I've been done programming since basic uh, a long time ago. Um, and so we've now developed an app called the Revenator. And the first thing I learned is that this thing doesn't really work, and I have to keep going back over. <laughs> Um, so this is the restaurant revenator, uh, sort of like uh, something Arnold would do, um, and it really has three items, how big, how much, how fast. So I give out the iPads, I say, all right, figure out in teams how much money would um, the Cheesecake Factory make. And so there's all these exercises where students go out and they visit local hotels, or for this exercise, visit local restaurants, and figure out how much money does this restaurant make. Uh, so let me go this way, let's go back to done. Uh, and so there are, this is my first app, um, uh, it has the view name on it, uh, and basically just three questions, which is how big a restaurant is, number of seats, um, how fast, how fast, how many times you can turn the seats in a, in a meal period, and how much, which is the average check. And just because it's on the iPad, it becomes fun, it becomes a game. And so the students really get into it. So for example, we have these little slides. So we have uh, uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, and so for breakfast, we can take the seats. Well, we, right now we have uh, no seats turned uh, because they don't do breakfast. So there's no, there's, uh, there's very little revenue there. Um, there's no revenue there. Uh, so if we go to lunch, say, well, here's a, we are now turning half a seat. Well, what if we turn the sort of half a seat per meal period? We can turn all the tables one, one and a half times. What to do to your revenues for the day? And so what you'll see is the revenues change both here, here, and then up there. And we switch over to uh, dinner, and we say, well, instead of 250 <coughs> seats, what if we have outdoor dining? And we go from 250 seats um, to 300. Or we can always just change it down here. And the students love it. It becomes a great game. And say, all right, and they come up with what the revenues are. We take it for daily, for weekly, for yearly, Mm, about nine and a half, that's about right for a Cheesecake Factory. And they say, well, what if it's a small restaurant? So you go to these little boutique, restu or boutique restaurants, or little small places, and they say, well, you can't have 250 seats, you have 25 seats, where are you gonna make your money from? Average check, and so you raise your average check. And we have the students keep going this exercise, and becomes, for them it becomes a game, it becomes a learning exercise at the end of managing those three numbers. Uh, and the best part about this is that it'll be on iTunes on fall for 99 cents each. That was my favorite commercial. Uh, and so I'll well, send you an email to go ahead and buy it. So that's an example of using the technology. And we'll have questions at the end. Uh, I don't know if Chris mentioned the email for about all this stuff. Could you just repeat the name so I can uh, Oh, the restaurant Revenator. <laughs> Revenator. Uh, um, Thank you. You're very welcome. So let me go back over. Generally in iBooks? Yeah. So let me switch it over to, that was to Dr. Peter Sanya. Yeah. We're, we're here again 9 and 11 tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Tip your waiter. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Peter Sanya. And uh, when Dean Muller asked me to do something with iPad, well, I did something different. Uh, I have actually uh, uh, developed a new educational concept in conjunction with Pearson Prentice Hall, a leading uh, publisher. 
the idea was to build a, a collection around a modular approach. Modules are essentially standalone learning units that include all pertinent facts about one specific uh, area and obviously concise instructions to achieve uh, the set learning uh, objectives. So <coughs> basically, uh, my problems, I had a problem uh, a little bit more than nine years ago. Dean Muller was not around yet. Uh, I, was asked wasn't born. To teach, uh, I was asked to teach different courses, and one of them was food and beverage management. Since I was in food and beverage with four seasons, I said, well, it will be very easy. Well, it was not. <laughs> it was not. And uh, I couldn't find the right textbook at all. And I still, after nine years, I still don't have a textbook. Uh, and I started to sit down, <coughs> I sat down and I was kind of thinking about this whole textbook selection process. And I kind of realized that it seems that there is a consensus among instructors in terms of what we should teach in a human resources type of course, hiring, firing, unions and so on, marketing. We know approximately what we should focus on. But it seems that in some of the operational courses, like lodging or food and beverage management, uh, we, it's not the case. Uh, students, future leaders, need to, uh, are expected to master a broad set of skills to perform adequately in the industry. In any case, once again, I couldn't find the right textbook. So I had uh, enough motivation to do something about when uh, Dean Muller arrived. And I said, let's use uh, his bu other buzzword called modification. Let's start some sort of significant change. Well, uh, once again, as I said, uh, we started to work a little bit more than a year ago with Pearson uh, Prentice Hall. And obviously, uh, the initial release of modules have become food and beverage management because I'm a selfish person. I'm teaching food and beverage management. Um, we set a goal. We would like to develop up to 70 uh, standalone modules only on food and beverage management. A handout and uh, the first 10 modules printed uh, in a custom book are sent around. All right? And all I need is the two books because that's all I have <laughs> um, at this point. So uh, there we are at right now. First of all, as you see, I try to build a curriculum because it's kind of complex, the food and beverage curriculum, around nine clusters. These are different curriculum sections, if you want. Uh, and within those sections, the total uh, expected number of modules is 70. The first 10 modules have been released. Another 10 uh, modules are in production as we speak. And as you see, the status of the rest of the project. Now, one interesting difference is I believe we were able to achieve with this module project compared to many other textbooks. We try to stay away of generalists. We don't look for people who know everything about the industry. We carefully identify module authors who are passionate about one specific topic, and most importantly, they know about the topic. <laughs> uh, if you look at the first 10 modules, uh, one of the first published author is Dr. Hudson. But if I look around in the, in the classroom, we have at least three, four uh, coming soon module authors. Now, uh, so what we try to achieve also with this whole uh, module collection is to design those modules with instructors uh, and students in mind. Uh, what, if, I, if I should highlight one important benefit of the module project, that it's the modular approach allows us to use uh, these learning materials for face-to-face, uh, -face, online, blended education, and most importantly, they are perfectly suitable for iPad. Uh, teaching. From the student's perspective, just one benefit, it's, it's cheap. It's cheap. Who has the book right now? Who has the, one of the books? I'm just checking if you still have it. <laughs> uh, 
It includes 10 modules. Each module allows instructors to focus on one specific topic in one or two 90 minute classes. So basically, you have the material for a semester because you may want to organize a trip to uh, another visit restaurant in Hawaii, <laughs> a colleague is from Hawaii, uh, or you want to invite a guest speaker, or maybe you want a midterm. In any case, you have the material for one semester. The cost for one semester is $50. That's it. I think students pay more currently for a textbook if you want to buy a textbook. So it's cost efficient. So uh, <clears throat> what I have noticed in the classroom, because right now uh, the a pilot project uh, has been rolled out at Boston University. It is now in its second semester. When Chris came, we started to work on it, and I have been testing the modules for the second, for the second consecutive semester. Uh, what's happening, uh, students are exposed in a moment, I will show you a few pages from, uh, from a module. But students are exposed uh, to short concept overviews. Obviously, I have to say something. But most importantly, we include iPad activities, web-based, and collaborative exercises. So the format uh, is centered on an active learning um, approach that is, I would say, very, very, very hands-on. Since I have been using modules, but I notice that I can spend significantly more time for problem solving. All right. So instead of a one-man show, uh, we can also focus on uh, on solving problems. And interestingly, I was listening to the presentations. Dr. Uh, Tucker and Dr. Ocean uh, mentioned almost the same thing, and I would like to join them. That overall, my role seems to be shifting. There is a dramatic, significant uh, shift from a knowledge disseminator type of faculty member to a facilitator of learning. This is what I have noticed. So uh, once again, you uh, can see a, a sample module uh, in one of the books. This is, for example, one module, a few pages from one of the 10 modules, restaurant revenue management, basic concept. Have you ever seen anything about restaurant revenue management? I don't <laughs> think so. OK, so it's here. Um, Basically, what we try to do, uh, as I said, to make it very instructor and student friendly, and we try to incorporate at least 10 different ways of challenge in uh, students and also sharpen their critically thinking skills. All right? So I think uh, anybody can uh, be able to teach, uh, teach them. All right, so uh, to summarize, to summarize, uh, um, summarize it, uh, the first 10 modules are available. The first 10 modules are placed in uh, Pearson's uh, custom uh, library. As we speak, the modules are available in printed format. I do not use printed format. <laughs> I only use them in an electronic way on iPad. And the future of uh, this whole project or collection, it's in your hand. Thank you. And Dr. Bloom is continuing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter. Um, you'll notice some similarities between what I do in the classroom and what Dr. Ocean does in the classroom. He is our longest uh, tenured faculty member. I am our shortest tenured faculty member, so he got first dibs on the university IT department. <laughs> it was just the development of, of his work. And actually, it was a great challenge for me because I wanted to see how far we could extend and push the iPad technology in the classroom in a way that anyone could literally set this up as a faculty member to develop something to use in class. So my application I call the BU Hotel Valuation Model. Um, one of the areas that I research and spend time in industry is in valuing and owning hotels. Um, I use it in our <coughs> core uh, hotel operations and technology class. Really is the last lecture of that class. We talk about purchasing a hotel. And I use that, the exercise, to help students think about what are the drivers to how you value a hotel. Um, I have them work with hotels that they've been working through the semester. Typically in this class, I might have 35 to 40 groups of two students each. They're out observing a hotel, uh, service levels, facilities, things like that. They go to the hotel two or three times over the course of the semester. For this final exercise, I have them think about 
what is this hotel worth? So I have 35 to 40 different student teams actually doing this exercise live uh, in the classroom. So the learning outcome certainly is related to uh, giving them an opportunity to understand those key drivers, also helping them get more familiar with the iPad technology. Um, one of the other additional benefits for me is I really use it kind of as a sales pitch uh, to get them to consider enrolling in my electives. Many students are afraid of finance-driven, real estate-driven courses. So this helps make it a little more accessible uh, to them. And then we also, as part of it, uh, another piece of this is we actually take the values that they derive for their hotels and go into an open source database called opencoms.info where they can actually look at and see what hotels are transacted for in the Boston area over a given period of time. So it's a very, very interactive uh, exercise. For those of you who may or may not remember uh, from your days in the classroom, these are really uh, the key drivers uh, in terms of how we value a hotel. We can do it in many, many complex ways. We use discounted cash flows and all sorts of other obtuse terms, but I've really tried to take it and use it in a way uh, that provides some very, very simple uh, application. So this is actually an application in the Numbers app, which as Dr. Tucker said, is really uh, Excel for the iPad. There is no Excel version, you have to use iPad. Um, but one of the great things that uh, I discovered after some experimenting is that there, because it's an interactive technology, <coughs> there are a number of tools that you can use that are built into the program, very simple to use, so that a student can, so we, I say to each student, put in the number of rooms in your hotel. Hopefully they know that, they've looked at that. So in this case, let's put a 200 room hotel into the model. For days of the year, you'd think that might be a static number of 365, but we can actually limit it through the functionality to make it a leap year or not a leap year. Those are the only two options. So again, trying to make it very foolproof for the students because one of the lessons that I learned is in numbers you cannot protect individual cells. So students, it's very easy for students to delete a cell not be able to get it back, so I'm very clear about highlighting uh, the reds and greens. Here, I actually use a slider to give them experience with a couple of different touchpad technologies. So maybe we have a hotel that runs 80% at a rate of $120. Percent of room revenue, total revenue. So I want to think about, we talk about how much food and beverage in your hotel? Is it rooms only operations that have a large catering component? So really trying to bring all the things we think about in terms of hotel into the exercise <coughs> itself. What's its profit margin? I've preceded this with a lecture where we look at the star host data so they have some idea and PKF trends data so they have some idea of what's an appropriate range of profit uh, for a hotel. And again, asking them to think about their hotel. And then we look at the math part, right? The part that scares them. How do you actually value a hotel? Because we've gotten to that operating income. Now we want to look at how would we actually buy a hotel? How much debt can we get for the hotel? Maybe today, 50% debt, 50% equity. What's the cost of debt in the current market? Maybe 6%. What kind of return does the equity investor want? Maybe 15%, the cap rate of 11%, and the value for that particular hotel of $19.9 million or $99,000 per room. And again, so I encourage them to play around. What are the drivers? How do these things work? And we minimize the model to really only being the drivers that, that are absolutely mandatory in helping to derive uh, valuation. And then again, we go onto the web <coughs> together and individually and collect the data and talk about it in the classroom. How much has this hotel sold for? Why is it worth more or less? Why it's more or less than what you thought uh, it might be worth in, the, <coughs> in your model? So for me, some of the lessons learned, um, for me the iPad, incredibly strong uh, opportunity for student learning. Um, again, our students really only use them in the classroom. We think about 10 to 15% per percent of our students actually own uh, the iPads themselves. And we don't have a program current where they can check them out. So as more and more students get them and can use them, we can develop more and more exercises that can be used outside the classroom. An exercise like this, I mean, we've shown you, uh, Dr. Ocean showed you a uh, restaurant revenue model, I've shown you a hotel valuation model. Think about the applications for food and beverage cost control and all of these kind of mathematical concepts that we've thrown out on boards and transparencies that students can kind of do live with you now in the classroom and really understand how the pieces <coughs> interact. Um, I, I drive this program actually through Blackboard, uh, which has some limitations in terms of how you open it, how you keep the file, um, things like that. And Blackboard has its own app. With you, yeah, Blackboard has an app that, dri that drives you to their website. It, there are a lot, one of the great lessons is no matter, be prepared to adapt when you're in the classroom, be prepared to change the exercise. One time, 
it loaded up an older version where everything was locked, so I could only do it myself for them. Um, and then Keynote itself has its own um, limitations and successes as well. I said ability to, to not lock data. Um, one of the challenges also is if you're not using a Mac, developing things in Excel and trying to port it into Keynote is a little bit of a challenge. This actually, this spreadsheet actually was done in Excel, and then I was able to convert it uh, to Keynote and derive the functionality uh, through Keynote that's not available in Excel in any case because of the touch screen. So those are some of the things that, uh, uh, that I've done. I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Eric Browning, and if I may, uh, Eric Browning is actually a great example. We've extended our program to our adjuncts as well. Eric's actually an adjunct with us, teaches our revenue required revenue management course, and in his full-time life is the regional director for revenue management for one of the largest, and I mean largest, hotel companies. Um, so an example of not just working with the full-time faculty, but we've really tried to extend this program and bring the adjuncts into using it, and Eric will show you some of the things that he does with it that are very applicable to uh, industry as well. Great, thank you. Um, so I teach, I'm in revenue management, I teach the revenue management course. Um, and it's a required course in Boston University, which I love. Um, <laughs> because it's just near and dear to my heart. Um, you know, it's, I teach at a very high level because it's required, uh, and I have lots of different types of students in there. Um, you know, it's somewhat technical in nature, and so what happens is, is that for a lot of my students, I find that concepts are just so new to them. They just really haven't thought about it. Um, uh, and I can go into different examples about what they haven't thought about. But there's a lot of different things they just haven't thought about. It's all very, very new. Um, and most really don't intend to pursue a career in revenue management. And so my goal is not necessarily to teach people to become directors of revenue management. My goal is just to tell them this is, this is what it is. Um, but because the, 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 the information is somewhat technical, I really had a tough time knowing what the students could understand when I was talking and what they really had absolutely no idea of what I was uh, saying. Uh, and so the only time I was able to assess that was in a formal grading environment. Um, and because I have a full-time job, um, I have to be somewhat careful with my time in terms of how much grading I can do. So uh, I didn't necessarily like, like that. So, I would stand up in class, I've got 85 students, and I ask a question, and I got nothing, right? Just dead silence. And then maybe after three classes, three or four students start to become brave, and they're the same students at the end of the, the, end of the semester. So uh, I had to find a way to gauge, okay, what do they understand? So I know those three people know. <laughs> But I got like 80 more. Yeah. <laughs> this never happened for full time faculty. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I've been using iPads for a lot of things, but one of the key things that I've been using in, the, in, in just about every lecture is for audience response. I mean, it's not new, um, there's lots of different solutions out there. Uh, most technologies are all revolved around clickers. Um, you know, frankly, it's not fun. You know, there's just a little tiny remote with four buttons on it. Uh, it doesn't say much, it's like <coughs> color. Uh, the other thing too that I like about the iPads is that um, there are a lot of functions I can use uh, that are not just related to the audience response. So for example, we use RevSim um, as part of the class. And for those of you who don't know, it's just a basic, basic simulation type software where they work in groups throughout the semester and manage revenue for a hotel and see who wins at the end of the day in terms of making the most money. So I can use the iPads, they log in and they, they do that. So uh, there are lots of other things that they can use it for in class. So um, this is the audience response I've been using. It's called Clicker School. I'm just gonna go very, very quickly through it so you can get a sense of what I see and what the student sees. So I show my question. The question doesn't matter, by the way. And I just hit start polling. Um, I kind of know what the answer is, which is how <laughs> there, right? The student sees this. Um, so I was running behind in time and I was able to take a screenshot from my iPad because I was sitting in the airport in Fort Lauderdale last week and so it's on my iPhone, which is why it's sort of weird. Um, anyway, the student sees this, but it kind of demonstrates that they're not necessarily stuck with just one device. They can use their computer, they can use the, it's, it's a bit, I try to keep it somewhat flexible. So they go through and they decide what, the, what their answer is. Uh, and then as the students come in and answer their questions, I get this running total where I see who's answered by name, who hasn't answered by name, and what the distribution of responses is. So in this type of scenario, I just, I just had one 
student who's just me. <laughs> right. But if I have 80, I'll see a graph um, down there. All right, and so then um, I send it back to the students on their individual devices, and they get the immediate feedback of, here's what I selected as the student, and this is the right answer. And if I choose, I can also send them back the distribution of grades throughout the class. So <coughs> immediately they know um, who, who isn't engaging, right? So if people are not answering, they're not engaging. Um, maybe looking at Facebook, I don't know. But I know their names, and I'll tell you, they didn't know that until like the third class, <laughs> right? And so I said, but Melissa, you haven't answered three questions. <laughs> <laughs> Love <of> nervous laughs. Um, but what, the benefit, of course, is if, if a lot of people are getting it wrong, um, I can change, I can, I can go back and reinforce that material, I can talk about it again. Um, I can make sure that they understand. And, that, and then I can add more questions. So if it's a concept that I just didn't realize was confusing, um, I can just add more as I go. Uh, and then the other thing too, is a lot of times they get it right, but it reinforces. So if we're just calculating average rate, um, but I tell them to calculate average rate for the month of September, but only give them a little bit of the information so that they do some multiplication. You know, I tell them we have to multiply the number of days of the month, Seems easy, but sometimes people forget. So it kind of reinforces that, that that's what has to happen. And I know that that gets reinforced. Uh, there's some reporting afterwards that I can store for later. So just kind of very quickly, you know, this is one of the call it quiz that I'm using and use in a class. It shows what my questions were. I can go back in and look and see by student, how did they do? Um, you know, so I can see, okay, what, what do they get right? What do they get wrong? Is there a particular question that people are getting just confusing um, two different questions, right? So they're either picking B or D, and let's say D is the correct answer. But B was sort of the, not the trick answer, but it was the more difficult to ascertain. So I'll know that right away. Um, also, if I have a student that I'm not so sure about, I can kind of see just individual students what they're doing. So um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I actually uh, have a uh, bias. My old mentor, Bob Chase, used to say that we spend a lot of time teaching people written communication and oral communication, but we don't teach them spatial communication. So I've been co-teaching a class in, in facilities design, uh, and I believe that that should be a, a major component. Now, when I taught that at UCF, we actually, every semester, ran out of copy access because we made so many physical copies of floor plans, uh, kitchen designs, hotel designs. We would get uh, the, the groups, 75 kids in the class. Sometimes we went through 2,000 copies of physical paper. And so uh, you know, I brought an example of, of something some of you might have seen before. This is just a, a you know, this happens to be our building. But here's a static floor plan. Right? And we want kids to be able to know how things relate in space like this. So if I gave them this and say, OK, look at a space in here, that's all they get to see. It's static. What we found with the iPad is that we, we can do some really cool things. So here's, uh, again, like, like Aaron had, uh, that's a project. This happened to be uh, last uh, spring's project. So we give them some, some guidelines. Now, I had uh, three different projects for this class, and you'll notice that this one looks a little fuzzy. Uh, one of the things that we are allowed to do now, because we've, we've moved this into the iPad uh, realm, is go back. This happens to be a 1928 archival floor plan of a private home on BU called the Castle. Uh, it was uh, originally built for this person down here. Oh, no, let me show you. Um, and uh, it was built as a private home. Now, I get to teach two things at the same time because what we see here is this would be the static plan, but because this is actually in um, microfiche, I can now put it into a PDF and it is now usable. Because you'll notice here is a historical way that we would have built the, the wall structure. Here is uh, some interesting things about the, the nature of what they used to have in this building. Two different kinds of coal. Uh, well, 
that, you know, what, that's a pretty cool thing. But then we also see the laundry room and uh, the drying room. And you'll see over here it says servant's water closet. <laughs> And over here is the servant's dining room. There's the kitchen. You can see the kind of equipment and the way that they laid out the kitchen in 1928. Uh, oh, and here's a really interesting thing. Here's the butler's room. And uh, that's the men's dressing room. And it happens to be a bath in the men's bath. Uh, but there's not one in the ladies. Um, and we see all of this kind of material. Now, what am I teaching him? I'm teaching design, but I'm also teaching history. and. And now, if every <coughs> student has this iPad in front of them, guess what they're doing while I'm talking? They're doing the same thing I just did. So what I do is, there's the old plan. Now here's, let's redo this, because this has since become the, the university pub. Right? So this is the current plan for the university pub. So now we look and say, well, where did all those things go? Well, here's the, the bar, and there's the, the um, the kitchen space now, and so we can say, let's look at the design space for the kitchen, and uh, what are the limitations? Why, you know, why can't we cook here? Well, there's no woods, there's no things, and oh, and now we see where there's storage and access in the men's bathroom, and all of a sudden, this becomes an interactive learning device on teaching design in a different way. That's the same floor plan as we just we just saw, or we can take this drawing, which is static, and say, here's our floor plan, and Oh, you know, uh, for this particular uh, <laughs> section of class, we're going to talk about the electrical outlets and, and the kinds of um, electrical plans we might need for our current computer lab. Now, here's a, an interesting aside to this. And I'm going to guess that most of you uh, have a facility that is a computer lab. It's uh, desktop PCs. It's probably Dell or something like it. Um, it's probably really current. You bought it in the last two, two years. But it's 1985 technology, because that's when they, the PC was introduced. And we all rushed out because they cost $3,000 a piece. We can't expect our students to buy their own PC, so let's build PC labs. And they're still using them to check their email and to print at your expense. <coughs> uh, we went from PCs to laptops, and now we've gone to tablets. And we know that the tablet is going to be what the students are using. So here's, you know, there I can show you what, a, what it looks like for electricity. But that, that particular teaching lab is from 1985. It just happens to have new equipment in it. But the teaching technology is the same. And you might have noticed that we, we're using an iPad to teach this class. Uh, this, is, this is all on the iPad in front of me. One of the things that many of us don't like about having laptops and with students in laptops is they tend to fold them up and hide behind them, and we really don't know what they're doing. They're watching, you know, uh, Snooky and, and the situation, or they're, they're checking their email. But with the iPads in front of them, what, what changes is because of the, the footprint, they put it in front of them, and they're looking at you while they're, they're studying on the iPad. We've changed the, so many of the things in the classroom when we teach, when we teach with this. Um, this was another piece, of, another project. This is a uh, current kitchen, and we, and you can just see. Okay, here I can, I can say, let's just look at the office space, or let's, let's just see the kinds of things, and the students can can immediately go into to the space that we're looking at. So design now has changed. We've changed the way we do design as well. Um, so to wrap things up, uh, first thing is we you've seen examples of all four of these technology applications in the classroom. We have used all of them. That's a picture of the cart that we use. Just so you know, I think one of the things that, that's been um, uh, impressive about this is that we've been able to take us. We're small enough that we can do this quickly, but large enough so that we could, in fact, take some non-tuition dollars. This was, this was um, uh, off you know, um, discretionary funds. But one of these carts, fully loaded, 30 iPads plus the Mac plus the cart, uh, was basically $22,000. Uh, this is an affordable mobile technology. Right? Uh, you can, you, you know, I know everybody's uh, constrained by resources, but it is possible. Uh, one of the things that I think, oh, uh, one of the, uh, just before I forget, we have one more faculty member who's uh, currently in China. Uh, she teaches a financial accounting class. Uh, and many people say, how do you teach accounting using this technology? There is a brand new uh, program I, uh, I author. She has turned all of her material into an iBook format. It is an, a brand new uh, uh, type of iBook format. She's turning all of her 
accounting worksheets into iBooks that will then be uh, online so that they, they are interactive worksheets. So instead of using, uh, she's for years has been teaching with an overhead projector. She just <laughs> couldn't find any other way to do this. It is now, uh, she's been working on it. She's got the first uh, five chapters done uh, in an iBook format. Um, and so what it comes down to um, is the challenge, I think, um, and maybe this is something, you know, I'm betraying a dean's trust here, but <coughs> I looked at this as an opportunity for, for me as a dean to find the money to invest <coughs> some resources in some tools and then unleash the faculty's creativity. Um, it's a strange concept, but uh, you know, it, if you trust people to do what you ask them to do and then let them play, they will tend to come up with some really remarkable things. And for not what I consider to be a huge amount of money, we have spent the last year learning how to do this in a time when um, we're all being challenged to be better in the classroom. So that's the wrap. I, or the other piece is I can't believe that we actually had seven faculty present in an hour. <laughs> uh, uh, they all kept to their time frame, and uh, but we will open for questions. And I'd like everybody to come up and, and so you can ask them directly. Yeah. Um, one of the things I noticed, and I'm sorry I'm being late, um, that I noticed that you could do with all seven of these. Put them into online learning. Did you bento on um, the newest version for the iPad? One, one of the things we found, I think everybody will back, back me up on this, is every time we said, this is what we want to do, uh, someone said, oh yeah, of course you can do that. And then it was, well, not yet. Uh, Inkling, Apple, um, our own technology people. One of the things that I think we've been fascinated by is that we are able to actually conceive of things that are, are supposed to be doable, but the technology hasn't kept up with us. And, uh, we're, we're I've been playing with that one in like yeah. Inkling. We use something different. Yeah. I've been able to use questionnaires to that. It's I'm a little able to just pull it in, and it's all right there in one big data sheet, and I can email it to me. I can do anything. I can do it even into Excel, yeah. which is really nice. It's just really cool. There's so much that you can that we're going to be able to learn about. We just wanted to show you that it's it's possible to just start. Yeah. Um, you said you purchased thirty. There, there's 30 in each cart. So we, we bought 60. So we bought two carts plus the 20 for the faculty and staff. Oh, okay. So we have 80 all told. How do you manage it so that um, scheduling who's using the iPad in the classroom? Uh, we, uh, one of the things we've done, and two things that, that need to go in this. We could not do this without the person standing in the back of the room. I'm going to embarrass her, but Jen Salmon has taken a, uh, a, a journey with us over the last year to become uh, the technology leader. She knows more about the Apple uh, iPads than anybody at our university. Uh, so she's come along with us as well. So have uh, some of our um, administrative staff. We roll these and uh, we book them in advance just like you would uh, anything else. And then the cards go, uh, they're on wheels. Uh, a work study student takes them down to the class at the beginning. Students <coughs> sign out and take one, and then they sign it back in and, and give it back to us. We don't even uh, use, you know, I, we don't require them to give us a card or anything else. In the entire first year, we lost one the first week because we just didn't know what we were doing. We have only lost one iPad, and that's in two semesters of, and every semester. It's really not as hard as it sounds. Yeah. So for the future, do you think there will be some possibility um, for the game to provide uh, one for each uh, actually, I've got a donor that w that was what we talked about. We can do that entire, uh, you know, for 400 students, uh, we, we talked about trying to get, uh, basically, it would have been under $100,000 to do that. We, uh, when we met with uh, Inkling last year, they estimate that last year it was 5%. This year, they think that between 15 and 20% by next year, 2013, more than 50% of students will have their own iPads or some kind of tablet base. Uh, which we know that it's going to be a, a, an open market. Uh, we're supplying this now. Uh, I actually think we've moved past having to supply them for the students. Uh, they can supply their own. They're, they're, uh, when the iPad 3 comes out, and then the smaller one is going to be the 7-inch, seven, uh, seven I think they'll probably be affordable for most people, just like laptops were. We didn't provide laptops except for the first year. The technology is, you know, this. I think they just passed uh, 60 million iPads sold. Uh, they're going to catch up to us faster than 
then we have to supply them. When we started this, yes, we talked about it. I'm not going to do it now. I don't think we need to. Anybody else? Did you enjoy this? Was this fun? Yeah. Okay.